The United States of Captain America finds Steve Rogers remembering himself saying that he's loyal to nothing but the American dream. But he knew that that dream isn't real since when he wakes up, it goes away and they are left with the yearning for what was taken. He knows that's the one kind of dream, but lately he's been spending his days in the country he's beginning to think is an America of two dreams and one lie. Boiling some water and getting his cleaning supplies out in preparation for cleaning his shield, Steve knows the first American dream is not real and it's the one people expect to just be handed to them, get angry when it disappears, but the truth is it never existed. He remembers the German word for nostalgia, for a place that no one has ever been to or a place that might not even exist, but he knows that they have a word for that too, and it's called Americana. As he cleans the shield, Steve knows the dream was never real since it doesn't get along with their reality or other cultures or immigrants or poor and the suffering, and the white picket fence becomes a gate to keep them out, but they are at their best when they try and keep no one out. He knows a good dream is shared with everyone and when it isn't it becomes the American lie. Steve knows that the lie is the real problem because it's an empty promise, remembering him not long ago telling the people to come there for a better life, but instead they would get a raw deal. And then there is the second real dream that they reach for and work for and toil for and fight for, and while they never might reach it, they never stop trying. Steve knows that this is the dream and the Smithsonian is putting a, an exhibit on about Americans who fight, but he doesn't like that name since sometimes they fight when they feel like they could handle things another way. He knows there are Americans who fought but also who reached and laid themselves bare and did it without shields or serums or metal suits. He thinks about the museum wanting to put his real shield on display, knowing that it would mean more to people. But unlike other people who have reached selfless clarity, Steve finds himself stripped of what he is meant to stand for. Steve knows that he is just repurposed for people's agendas, he's an easy target when things in the country get bad, and sometimes everything just seems so ridiculous to him. He wonders if he has caused more divide than uniting people since the shield can be something to hide behind, and wonders if he's been hiding behind it too. Steve is suddenly attacked by a man dressed like Captain America, who beats Steve down and knocks him out with his own shield. Awakening soon after, Steve finds the shield missing, contacting Sam to get into the airspace above Brooklyn ASAP. The Falcon meanwhile doesn't know what he's meant to be looking for, but Steve says the guy moved really fast and he couldn't even lay a hand on him. He tells Sam that the man is dressed like Captain America, but Sam doesn't know if he means in his uniform or just like a 90s J. Crew ad. Soon Sam spots the man moving very fast through a part of the town as Steve suits up and goes out on his motorbike. Sam says whomever this guy is, he's heading towards the Hellgate Bridge with a freight train approaching from the other side. Sam pursues the man but he's too fast as Steve arrives at the bridge, spotting the man climbing up the wall and giving chase to him. Steve tells the man to stop as he throws the shield at the train, blowing up its engine before speeding away. Steve tells Sam to head him off but Falcon knows they've got another problem as another train is incoming down the other side of the track and the freight train wreck is blocking the tracks. Sam says he can't push 200 tons out of the way so Steve races at the oncoming train, leaping onto the cabin and telling the conductor to break. The man does so as Sam swoops in and saves them from the explosion. Steve races towards the carts, telling the people who can hear him that they need to stay calm as he helps them move out of the wreckage. Soon he spots someone in the darkness with a shield and gives chase, tackling him as he demands to know why he's using his shield to do something like this. Sam tells him to stop since that's not the thief, as he finds it's just a kid dressed like Captain America. Steve demands to know who he is, learning the kid calls himself Captain America, but Steve thinks that a joke like that will get his teeth broken. The boy says his name is Aaron Fisher, but Steve wants to know what his deal is and what it is with the costume and shield. Aaron says that he just rides the rails with his boyfriend, but they broke up and he stayed in Missouri. He apologizes since he begins rambling when he's nervous. Steve demands to know why he's dressed like Captain America. So the boy says that there are a lot of cool people on the rails and they're like one big family But there are also some really bad people on the rails and he takes care of folks like that Sam thinks that he's just some Woody Guthrie Captain America, making Aaron excited to meet the former Captain America as well He says that Sam fights for everyone and he wants to be like that as well and Sam and Steve appreciate it, asking him to help them get the people to safety. Aaron says that there are more captains out there as well in more places that Steve can think of. 
Steve, however, spots a sniper laser on the young man, quickly tackling him out of the way as Sam spots the female sniper up on the bridge. Steve whips Aaron's makeshift shield at the assassin, but she manages to escape into the water below. The heroes know that the kid was her target, but Aaron knows that he's just some kid on a train. Sam says he's not. He's Captain America, as Steve asks about the other captains. Aaron knows they aren't some super team, just some people, and they don't really know one another, but they are all over the country. The next day, Sam finds Aaron skipped out on Steve after getting medical attention that night. Sam knows that there are a total of five caps they encountered last night. He's counting himself as two since he's worth at least that. Steve says they have a superhuman pretending to be him and causing havoc with his shield, and they have an underground network of Captain Americas as well as an unknown female assassin who almost killed one of the captains. Steve thinks that the woman is targeting the whole network, so they have to find these people. Sam asks about the cap they fought, but Steve says that he's just trying to sully the shield and cripple what it stands for. Sam thinks that both of them outnumber this villain 50 to 1, mostly because Sam is counting himself 59 times, so Steve thinks maybe they should go after him. Sam wants him to cut to the part where he says to suit up, since he's already in. Steve knows that he needs a shield, and lucky, Sam has an extra as the friends shake hands, getting ready to hunt down Captain America. Sometime before, Aaron Fisher goes to see the Cosmic Cubes with his friends, knowing his life has been hard as a wanderer, but he's seen lots of interesting places and met lots of interesting guys and sometimes he gets to help people. At the homeless encampment, one of his old friends gives him a bit of advice since there are kids like him missing all over the city. Kids with nowhere to go and no one on their side. Aaron knows he was abandoned so he knows what it's like and while it was a long shot, maybe he could find them and look out for them in a way that no one did for him. Since after all, that's what Captain America would do. Aaron begins looking around the city, finding the downtown camp has been deserted. Asking around town, he finds a woman knows that Roxxon cleared out the downtown camp weeks ago in an order to build the new stadium for the city and to get rid of people like them. The woman says that everyone pretends like they don't exist, but Aaron says that he'll figure out what happened. That night, Aaron breaks into the Roxxon construction site, remembering that the mayor bragged about removing the homeless, but Aaron knows he was the only one who cared about where they were going. Sneaking past the armed guards, he heads to the site office where he hears something about a desert site and how someone wants to gather up more homeless for it. Aaron is suddenly smashed on the back of the head by one of the guards, later awakening next to another guy who knows that Aaron got hit on the head pretty good, knowing he must have put up a fight. The man introduces himself as Adrian as Aaron says that he came to help them, but Adrian wonders how he's going to do that as he learns that they are in the desert camp that Roxxon shifted all of the homeless people to to build the stadium, leaving them there to rot. Adrian knows that it's hard to believe that, that they're just a few miles from the highway and they are forced to work in the Roxxon facility there, and some of them have been there for months with no hope of a future, but all they need is for someone to give them a chance to get out. Aaron knows that Roxxon cannot be allowed to do what they want, and while he's been on his own for a long time, he hasn't given up and he won't let them do this, so they need to stand up for themselves and show them that they aren't afraid. Adrian wonders how they will do that, so later on Aaron makes and paints up a Captain America shield as he remembers how he grew up looking for signs that he belonged in the world and it took time, but he found them in extraordinary people united in fighting for a common cause, people like friends and lovers and teachers and activists and heroes. He always wondered when the time came, what would he do, and on that night, he found out. Aaron, dressed as Captain America, attacks the Roxxon soldiers, beating them down with his makeshift shield, as he notes how everything felt so different when he picked it up. Like he had become more than himself and become a symbol to those he was protecting, and a legacy to those who fought before him, and a promise of hope for the future. Later on, Aaron and his newfound love Adrian ride the train out of the city, where Aaron knows when he's lucky, he gets to help people, and he didn't come from much, and he has nowhere to go back to, but he can go forward, and he doesn't have to do it alone. Later on in Gettysburg, Steve remembers a time when he took a trip there as a Boy Scout in 1928, doing a tour of the battlefields there. Steve remembers being riveted by the history, but also remembers he had to pee, but there was nowhere to go and he was scared to interrupt the guide or bother his teacher. Soon he snuck off to take care of it, but finds it's a mistake to go into the wheat fields there as the park ranger soon finds him, telling him this is hallowed ground and the latrines are elsewhere. Steve knows that almost peeing on Gettysburg isn't as funny as he probably thought 
thought it was, hoping he has paid back that debt. He remembers the damage they did to one another there on that battlefield, wondering if they really had came back from that at all. He soon hears a noise, knowing that's his signal as he knows about the other cap attack near Harrisburg, and a woman was arrested for busting up a new main line that was going to bring fresh water into the town. Cap meets with Sam, thinking that he wears the red, white, and blue the best, but Sam knows that two caps are better than one. Steve isn't so sure about that as he is asked about the new shield he was bringing. Steve says that he brought it but wonders if they could ditch the uniforms entirely thanks to this imposter stuff. Sam says that when they stop this, they're going to stop this as Captain America to remind those of what they really are about. They soon talk about Nichelle Wright, who has been charged with terrorism, yet she's dressed like Captain America, which Sam finds a bit ironic. Steve says that he's been charged with terrorism in the past as well, and he does feel a little weird that she's calling herself Captain America, making Sam wonder if he thinks that when he's not in the room, but Steve says he doesn't want to know what he thinks when he's not in the room. Sam knows that she's definitely got more in common with Aaron Fisher, wondering if she's part of this Captain's network, something Steve knows is more than likely, and he wants to know what happened with her. Sam thinks that the assassin lady is trying to set these people up, but soon wonders how Steve even got his bike into the National Park, since the park rangers wouldn't even let him this close. Steve says he's got an in with the park rangers, and he reminds Sam that he can't be hot rodding around since already people are suspicious of Captain America. Sam does a wheelie on his bike, wondering if this is what Steve meant, and Steve thanks him for the example. As they ride the road, Steve says that he wants to check on the pipeline Nichelle damaged and see what that was about. Sam wonders what happens when the local cops won't let them talk to her, so Steve says they might have to break a couple of rules. A few hours later, they arrive in Harrisburg, not realizing how bad it was as they survey the flooded streets. Sam knows that dozens will be homeless because of this, and people come by to see them, saying that they have had enough of all these stars and stripes crap. They also know that Nichelle had nothing to do with this, but another man says that she was the one causing all these problems. The woman says that Nichelle was the reason the water coming out of his tub was the right color, and she was the pride and joy of the community, since she does everything she can to help people. The two people continue to argue as Sam and Steve head into the flooded street. Steve knows that this had to be the cap imposter, since the damage on the pipes is consistent with rapid hits from his shield. Steve asks about Sam's new shield, learning that Misty Knight made it for him. Sam asks about the shield Steve has, since he doesn't appear to have one, but Steve shows him the one Tony gave him, activating his hologram shield, which Sam says looks like a beer logo hanging on the wall of a bar. Steve thanks him for the self-confidence boost as he says that he doesn't understand any of this, since the feds still want Aaron in relation to the train crash, despite Steve vouching for him. They still think that he's involved, and now Nichelle has been charged with destroying the pipeline, and on top of it all, their cap hunter still took a shot at Aaron, wanting him dead, but Nichelle was left alive to get arrested. Steve knows that whomever is behind this wants the country to hate anyone calling themselves Captain America. Suddenly, they are attacked by the speedster Cap, who says that that's the point and the hate will keep growing and growing. Steve thinks that it's brave for the villain to try and take them both on alone with only his fancy footwork, but the villain smashes Cap with his shield, thanking the hero for the great gift. Sam manages to take the weapon, saying that his mouth moves faster than the rest of him but suddenly he is shot in the arm by the assassin woman, who tells him the next bullet severs his spinal cord. Steve's hollow shield shorts out thanks to the water, something he thought Tony would have thought of as he throws a piece of driftwood at the woman, causing her to fall into the water as he checks on Sam, who still wonders why these creeps are there two days later. The speedster gets the woman out of the area, wanting to focus on Nichelle instead as Steve knows that they won't let her get away, but the police must have gotten to Nichelle first. Sam is up by the woman from before who tells them to make sure nothing happens to Nichelle. Steve knows that they want to destroy Captain America, the people, the name, the symbol, and the entire dream. Later on at the police station, the heroes are told Nichelle is off limits, but the heroes tell the cop that the people who shot at them earlier are probably on their way to kill her. The cop says that they are welcome to file a report and they'll look into it ASAP as the sheriff comes to see them, saying that he doesn't know what they did or who they did it to or why, but he doesn't care since the girl was a thorn in his side and never shut up about the water crisis and her protests, and now since finding out she's been dressing up and cracking skulls, they are done with her. Steve tries to tell the man that the thorn is trying to help, but the sheriff isn't interested in his excuses since she fits the profile. Sam knows what he means now, knowing that it's because she is black. 
The sheriff says that Sam said it and he didn't, so Sam grabs him, throwing him through the front doors of the building. Sam reminds Steve that they had to break some rules and Steve knows it's better treatment they would have gotten than from the shield thief, telling the others to feel free to file a report. Michelle meanwhile knows it sounds like the sheriff ran into some trouble, wanting the cop watching her to go and check it out as the heroes arrive. The cop hands the woman over to Steve, saying that he knew this wasn't right. Steve apologizes for what Sam did to his boss, but the man doesn't care since he's got a smile smart mouth and a lot of dumb ideas. Steve and Sam meet with Nichelle, who says she was told she couldn't have visitors. She knows it sounds like she won't get a fair trial as Steve rips the cell open. Nichelle confirms that she tussled with the other Captain America, telling them if it's cool with them, she's going to do this on her own. So she's got work to do and that's how the captains work. They fight on the ground, not in the clouds. As they leave, Nichelle spots something outside, tackling the sheriff out of the way as a machine gun rips the building apart, operated by the assassin outside. Steve blocks the bullets with his shield, frustrating the woman as she stops firing on him. Steve confronts her, wondering if that's all she's got, but the woman refuses to make him into a martyr since nothing unifies people more than a martyr. Steve asks why these other captains are being targeted and the woman says that it's his symbol and that will be broken and these people are nobodies and no one will trust them since they are trash, tools that they are using to tarnish his name before she kills them. Steve says that Nichelle is coming with them safely as she activates a flamethrower but Steve protects himself again with his shield as the woman and her speedster friend manage to escape. Steve tells Sam that the woman sounds German and they need to stop this now but Nichelle doesn't want to be part of their team. Steve thought that she called herself Captain America and Nichelle says that Isaiah Bradley said the same thing but look how they treated him. She says that captains take the idea of them and make it real for the people that Captain America and Sam Wilson don't have time for and that's what Isaiah Bradley did and that's what she does. Sam says that they don't ignore anyone but Nichelle understands since they have the Avengers and aliens and Baron Zemo to deal with, but these people have poisoned water, street crime, inequalities of every kind, as well as the more than occasional crooked cop. Steve asks what about the people out to murder her and the network, but Nichelle says the captains believe in Steve but they can't go away from those they protect. She thanks them for the save, knowing that if they see Aaron again, to say hi from her since he's a good kid. Steve knows that the woman has a point as the cops say the sheriff wants to talk with them, but Steve says that they are busy as they leave. Sam knows the heat will be on them now, no matter how true blue a cap they are. Steve thinks that this wild goose chase across the country will be educational and maybe they could use some schooling as elsewhere. The assassin tells the speedster not to ever speak again while on assignment since if the heroes figure out that he's really Speed Demon, the mission will be compromised. James knows that the woman is Sin, knowing that there is no harm in this. Sin says that she sees great things in baseball, activating Speed Demon's mind conditioning, causing the man to say that there will be no captain and there will be no America, so says Krieger Frau. The woman tells him not to call her that, wanting only to be called Superior. Later on, Nichelle is made aware that she is now a wanted woman, wondering what happens now since she can't go home. She hides under a bridge as a cop car comes by looking for her, knowing that she's got to ditch her phone and keep moving. Heading through the streets, she soon hears a scream, finding someone robbing a local restaurant. She recognizes the people inside are Taylor and Charles, knowing they have graduated from harassing people at protests to armed robbery. Donning her mask and hood, Captain America gets to work, racing into the back kitchen of the building, knowing this is a very bad idea, knowing it's as bad as the sit-in she organized in the mayor's office, knowing always to bring extra water and snacks like she didn't then. She quiets the kitchen staff as at the restaurant, the men discuss not having a plan for this, with Taylor saying that they were just having fun and celebrating the capture of Nichelle, saying the town is a lot nicer with her not in it. Nichelle makes her presence known, kicking Charles down before using a saucepan to knock him out. Taylor shoots at her, hitting her in the arm, saying that his father lost his job because of her activism and he had nothing to do with the company company poisoning the water supply. Charles tries to call the cops as Nichelle kicks Taylor in the stomach, demanding to know what innocence in the restaurant had to do with this. The cops arrive but Nichelle takes off, throwing her shield over a large fence out the back of the restaurant and clamoring over it, knowing she'll have to take care of her injured arm after she loses the cop following her. The cop says that she can't just attack a cop's son and get away with it but Nichelle tells him to go and catch the real bad guy she left behind in the restaurant. But the officer says the people she saved are the ones that called the 
them about her. As she escapes the cops, Nichelle is pulled into the alley by someone who takes her to a church, saying that they are meant to babysit the woman. Nichelle says that he scared her half to death, wanting to know who he is and where they are. The man says his name is Benjamin and they are in an abandoned church, so now it's time for her to answer his questions. She wonders where she's meant to go in her own town now, as Ben says they don't need vigilantes, they need her in the streets fighting for them like she used to. Nichelle says that she never stopped fighting since their work they did with the protests got them clean water. Ben wonders why then she is cosplaying, so Nichelle explains that when she was a college athlete, all she had to worry about was gymnastics and grades, and she kinda is doing the same thing here, since they organise a march and force lawmakers to do the right thing, but after hours they are unprotected and no one cares if they go missing or have things taken, and they cannot do the work and worry about their survival since no one is coming to save them. Soon Joan, Nichelle's big sister, comes to see her, knowing that she always knows where to find her and the coach had her students keep an eye out for her. Nichelle soon meets her former gymnast coach, told that Ben has taken her place on her team. Nichelle tells her that this is not safe to be around her, but the coach doesn't listen, wanting to take care of her and besides, Joan has something she wants to show her. Nichelle says that she's serious about this, but Joan knows that they are as well and that she doesn't have to do this alone. Nichelle says that she's not alone since she has the captain's network and they take out the trash in places that people have forgotten about or are deemed too small to care about. Joan tells her to eat her food and watch the screen she sets up since she has something for her. Joan starts a video on people from around the town showing their support for Nichelle and what she is doing, offering to help her back in any way they can. Joan knows that they all have her back so they want to find her a place to stay that night. Later that night, Aaron Fisher messages Nichelle telling her that some trouble is coming her way so she suits up, leaving her safe house knowing that she doesn't believe the fugitive hype since she's not going anywhere and this is where she was born and this is where she'll be of service and while there are no alien invasions or huge explosions, there is work to be done since she is a symbol in an ever-changing world and she is creating a symbol for her America and her neighbourhood. Later on, Speed Demon does his best Roadrunner impression as Cap and Falcon race after him, trying to determine which speedster they are up against as he heads across the southern Kansas border. The men fail to catch up to him so decide to sort through their evidence of who he is, quickly realising that the runner is Speed Demon, but the mysterious woman is still a mystery, although thanks to her German accent, Steve has a few ideas. Getting back on track, they know they need to stop Speed Demon from causing even more chaos across the country, so the heroes head to Topeka, Kansas to meet with Joe Gomez, another of the captains who is in danger thanks to Speed Demon and the mysterious female assassin. Joe doesn't get why anyone would care about him, but Steve knows they're actually after the stars and stripes they wear since they represent everyone. Joe decides to show them why he takes the captain thing so seriously, showing Steve his memorabilia room which keeps pictures, posters and everything in between of Steve's exploits as Captain America, revealing that he is his favourite cap. And he likes Steve because the hero means it when he says he means it, and he fights for everyone, even the people seldom seen by others, like Joe. Joe knows that Steve doesn't have to be his hero, he just needs to inspire him to be one himself. The team get to work on Joe's situation involving someone smuggling away some dynamite from a construction company, dynamite which the team theorised could be used to destroy an integration site in the city. Joe knows that they need to move, suiting up as the Captain America of the Kickaboo tribe and rolling out with his friends. As they check on the school integration site, Joe mentions that the governor candidate named Prescott, whom he backs and is a Cheyenne, spoke there last week. Week. The heroes know that the school isn't the correct target, as the female assassin attacks, but the heroes don't go down easy. During the fight, Steve learns that they are battling Cynthia, the daughter of Red Skull, who will stop at nothing until the heroes are all dead and their names drag through the mud. Steve is knocked out by the mysterious new player in the game, and when he awakens, he finds both Sam and Joe are injured. Joe, the most injured of them, is able to let Cap know that Prescott is speaking that day in town. The heroes race to stop Speed Demon as superior, knowing Joe was the target like Nichelle and Aaron before him. Getting Joe some medical attention, Joe knows he owes Steve two favours as Sam checks over the crowds, knowing someone is watching him. Just as Prescott takes the stage, Speed Demon attacks, flinging Cap's shield at the candidate. However, thanks to the quick arrival of the Winter Soldier, the man is saved from being decapitated. Bucky reunites with 
his friends, telling them that he's been tracking them since the police station incident in Pennsylvania, knowing that they could use some help. Speed Demon decides it's time to leave quickly, but Joe returns, hitting him in the face, but the villain still manages to escape as the hero knows he really needs a hospital right now. After Joe is taken care of, Sam, Steve, and Bucky regroup to lay down a game plan, learning that Prescott is dropping out of the governor race thanks to what happened, citing his family and other reasons why he wants to drop out. Steve knows that both him and Joe shouldn't be out of this game, but it's time they all got together to put this to bed once and for all. Sometime before, Joe Gomez awakens early to head out to his construction job with his friend Nikki. As they drive, he talks about how the Wrecking Crew destroyed a lot of the city. Nikki knows the job isn't what he wanted, but Joe is more than happy to help out, especially since the Avengers haven't caught the villains yet, hoping that they'll finally get caught so this can end. As Joe gets working on a crane, he sees a chopper crashing into a building nearby, ordering the site to be evacuated as he climbs his crane to try and help out. Unfortunately, the chopper had one of the wrecking crew on it. The bulldozer gets to work intimidating the workers on the ground, but Nikki won't have any of it. Attacking the villain, but bulldozer is bigger than her, easily overpowering the woman. Thanks to Joe's quick skills in the crane, he is able to bat the villain away with a steel girder, allowing Nikki and the others to get to safety. The attack puts Joe in bulldozer's sights, causing him to pursue the man up onto the crane arm, letting on that he was hired by someone to terrorize Kansas City thanks to the mayor having very dangerous enemies. Joe manages to trip up the villain, making him fall from the crane. While Joe survives thanks to the rope he tied around the crane and to himself, he soon learns his knots aren't exactly the best. As the rope undoes itself, he thinks about all the people who have been saved by the Avengers, but not him, despite his hope since 9 times out of 10, native people like him are just ignored. Joe's hope is answered however when Captain America saves him from falling. Later on, Cap thanks Joe for disarming bulldozers since it's no small feat now going toe to toe with a villain who gives Thor a run for his money. Joe knows that the scars he has run deep and there has been so much suffering in the name of red, white and blue, but when he dances in intertribal meetings with other tribes, they are the people of the land called America and they have been there long before America and they will survive it. So if Captain America's mantle represents the people, he's going to claim it for people like him. Later at the annual Kickapoo Pow Wow, Steve, Sam, and Bucky watch the traditional event play out, thinking about how America belonged to these people long before it belonged to any of them. Steve knows that his ancestors were colonizers, knowing that they were Irish and English, and he wonders if that gives him the right to bear the name of the land instead of someone else like Joe. Bucky tells him that Joe is Captain America, and just the fact that Steve thinks about these things makes him who he is. Sam knows that if he wants validation, he's asking the wrong guys, since Steve could be descended from slave owners. Steve though knows his family was against the owning of slaves and wanted it abolished, but still carrying the flag and wearing it is a heavy burden and he's thankful for everyone who has stepped up to bear its weight with him. Steve wants to leave so the festival's focus isn't on them anymore, heading to Colorado and to Sam's cabin where three days later the team continue to search for the false Captain America's whereabouts, finding nothing has come up. Bucky thinks that Sam could make serious money if he rented his log cabin on Airbnb as Steve finds that he can only reach Aaron and Ariel from the Captain's network and they are inbound. Soon the heroes arrive, meeting with the other captains, but Steve knows that there is one more he needs to recruit, and he's meeting him at a nearby bar. Bucky knows who he's meeting and doesn't want Steve to go as his friend takes his leave. Sam asks how Aaron and Ariel's trip was despite the car sickness from Ariel, learning that both of them just sung Hamilton the whole way there. Bucky warns them that this will get dangerous, but the heroes understand the stakes as Steve comes back, asking if Bucky is going to be coming with him. Bucky doesn't want to, but Sam knows that Steve will need help with their contact. At NORAD, Commander Krieger, Speed Demon, and Superior blow their way into the secure facility, told by their commander to have some fun while looking for what they need. Ariel and Aaron meanwhile play some video games as Sam picks up a distress call from NORAD, warning anyone who is listening of the attack by Krieger and her people. Sam assembles Aaron and Ariel as at a nearby bar, US agent is cut off by the bartender, but John refuses to take no for an answer, threatening the man as Steve arrives. John sees that Bucky is there as well, calling him the child, but Steve knows that he's just antagonizing him. Steve tells him that he is there for his help, knowing that he could use another Captain America, despite the man going by US agent these days. 
He tells John how his shield was stolen by a neo-fascist plot to murder an entire network of grassroots heroes and destroy the mantle of Captain America. John knows that can't happen and Steve knows that they have a lot of problems with each other, but he knows John loves the country more than most and he would give his life to protect it. Sam soon arrives, telling them of the invasion at NORAD as the captains head out, with John forced to ride shotgun on Bucky's bike since Steve doesn't want him drink driving, while Aaron and Ariel are forced to use their crappy car since both don't have Class M licenses. Steve reveals that his shield grants him access to certain secret clearances and projects he's involved in, like the ones at NORAD, meaning Krieger is after hate monger. Ariel wonders what that is, learning that it's a living psychoactive energy derived right from Adolf Hitler's consciousness. Bucky thinks that Cap is the living end of Godwin's law, which John tells Sam is the longer a conversation goes on, eventually it will involve Nazis. Steve doesn't believe that since he's fought many people who weren't Nazis, citing Batroc the Leaper as not a Nazi, but Aaron reminds him that Batroc once worked for Zemo, who in turn worked for Hydra, which was led by Red Skull, a Nazi. Steve gets it and the fascists really don't like him and he's glad about it. John knows that none of them are liked by fascists and they are all proud of that and he believes that they are all eager to wipe the floor with them today. At NORAD, Krieger and her team find hate monger's containment cell as the being recognizes Julia as she says that she wishes to give him his freedom. She tells him that America is ripe for the taking but Monger knows that Red Skull already tried and failed to take the country over. Julia knows that Red Skull used overt hate but they will use America itself against itself and Superior and her will act as governors of the newly fractured regions. She details her plans of using the symbols of liberty, the stars and stripes and the shield against the country that made it great. One lone soldier confronts the villain, demanding they surrender, but Speed Demon hits him in an instant as US Agent gets the drop on the speedster, while the Captain's America attack. Steve confronts Krieger, reminding her of her former codename Warrior Woman, which angers the Nazi, who throws Bucky back at Steve as Superior battles Sam, reminding them that her boss's name is Commander Krieger. Krieger thanks Steve and the others for coming, since it makes it easy for her to grind them all up at once. Aaron and Ariel attack the villain knocking the wind from her as the villain's influence over Speed Demon fails, making the speedster wonder where he is. The soldier from before returns, loading his gun as Superior throws the shield, bouncing it off the heroes as Steve takes her down, knocking the wind out of her. Speed Demon realizes that he was used by Krieger, charging the woman, but she wraps her whip around his neck, instilling her will upon him yet again. Sam and Bucky try and stop Krieger, but their hits do nothing to her as she raises Cap's shield, using her power through the shield to take control of the team. Luckily, before the influence takes full effect, Steve sweeps her legs from under her, but she doesn't stay down for long, using the shield to activate Hatemonger's containment and free him. Steve confronts the being, who takes on the form of Peggy Carter, trying to get Steve off guard, calling him an embarrassment to the country. Krieger escapes the room along with Hatemonger and Steve wants to go after her, but US Agent stops him, knowing that they've captured two of the villains and they don't need to chase Krieger to know where she's going. The soldier who helped them says that Monger is the dangerous asset, introducing himself as Captain Jeremy Merrick, and he was assigned to containment and study of Hatemonger. Steve knows that Merrick can help them in recapturing it, wanting to get info about where Krieger and Hatemonger are going from Superior. The woman refuses to talk as Speed Demon agrees to tell them whatever he knows, but he was under their influence for a long time and might not be of any help. Superior calls him weak, but thanks to her father inventing many hideous torture techniques, she has been able to master them all, so there is nothing the team of Cub Scouts can do to make her talk. John decides to take over, telling Superior that he was expelled from the Cub Scouts, wanting to have a little chat with the villain. Sometime before at Highgrove University, Ariel says goodbye to her friends who head out to a Halloween party. Her friend Mary Beth, who is holed up in her bed, tells her to go with them and have fun, but Ariel asks her how her arm is, worried for her friends since she won't let the man who did this get away with it. Mary Beth knows that he already did, and even if anyone could believe her, Elliot Carmichael is untouchable thanks to his family's connections to the college. 
She says that if she reported him, the Carmichaels would ruin her and he took her phone with all of the evidence anyway. Ariel knows that what happened wasn't her friend's fault and Elliot is a predator and a bully and she hates bullies. Donning her star-spangled costume and shield, she coyly reassures her friend that she won't do anything stupid. With her costume on, Ariel heads to the party, spotting Elliot amongst the crowd who was also dressed like Captain America. He spots Ariel, thinking that she is some ninja, wanting to see her moves, but Ariel rejects him, causing the man to grab her hard on the arm. Ariel frees herself, heading upstairs, but Elliot knows that she's just playing hard to get. Ariel heads to Elliot's dorm room, sneaking into the room and finding Marybeth's phone, knowing that Elliot doesn't want anyone seeing the incriminating messages he sent her friend. She spots Elliot's phone as well, taking it along with Marybeth's as the man enters the room, demanding to know what she is doing. Ariel says that she was just leaving as Elliot tells her that he doesn't want to hurt her, but Ariel finds that funny since she thought he loved hurting girls. Elliot hits her with his lacrosse stick, taking the woman by surprise since he's strong. The man wants to know if she's some school reporter or costume vigilante, grabbing her shield as he realizes that she's meant to be Captain America, wanting her to give it up since she's no Steve Rogers. The hero knees him in the groin, telling him that she's always been more of a Bucky Barnes fan. Ariel escapes back into the party where the injured Elliot finds that there are multiple female Captain Americas, allowing Ariel to escape into the crowd unseen. Later on, she returns to Mary Beth, revealing that she got her phone back and that she took Elliot's as well, knowing everything that's on it is going to the news tomorrow. Their friends, who are all dressed as Captain America, also return, telling Mary Beth that their mission was a success. Ariel tells her friend that they can't undo what happened to her, but they can make it really hard for people like Elliot to do it again, knowing next time they will get Mary Beth a shield as well. In the present, a US agent gets to work on Superior, reminding himself that he's best known for what he stands against, but they need to be careful about defying themselves by what they don't like or disagree with, otherwise they become known for what they despise, and to John, that is just empty hate. A man named Knox Jennings, meanwhile, continues to lambast Captain America for his so-called crimes on the media circuit, as Sam tires of watching this guy, but Steve knows that it has to be Hate Monger, since the man coincidentally appeared right after Hate Monger's escape from prison with Commander Krieger. Speed Demon thinks that he's probably just some sick amoral creep, but Sam thinks that he's talking about himself. Speed Demon says that he was hypnotized and the governmental overthrow isn't really his thing. Steve thinks that maybe he just wants this Nox guy to be hate monger, since if it's not, he's just another bulldog out there to tear them down. He hopes that Bucky and Ariel are having some luck, as in Colorado Springs, the heroes meet with Captain Jeremy Merrick, whose home has been vandalized by the Captain America haters. Ariel knows that Jeremy Jeremy made the tech that Hatemonger was imprisoned in, so maybe he's got an axe to grind with the, the captain. Jeremy can see that, since Hatemonger promised to kill him many times over the years while he was studying him. Bucky wants to go and secure the man's daughter from school as John returns with information from Superior, boasting about his interrogation techniques and upsetting Steve. John assures him that it's all permissible under the Geneva Convention as Sam asks him about the code he got from her. John reveals that it's a satellite transponder signal that Hatemonger is broadcasting from, spreading his influence. This all but confirms to Steve that Knox Jennings was tied to the villain as John says that once Monga and Krieger have built up their audience, Krieger will hypnotize them through Steve's shield. Steve asks how that's possible, so John explains the shield will act like a hypnotist's watch, being a focal point for Krieger's powers. Steve understands since the shield means a lot to a lot of different people and it's immediately recognizable to anyone. Speed Demon goes to see Superior, who asks him to free her. James refuses, knowing that while he's a villain sometimes, he's no Nazi. The woman calls him a weak game piece and a cheap tool for the strong like her to use. James attacks her in anger, allowing Julia to free herself from her bindings and knock the speedster out. The captains hear the commotion, telling the woman to stand down as she tries to escape, knowing they know her plan. Superior knows that they can't actually stop this since by dawn's early light, the nation will cower at the sight of Captain America's shield, and they will use it to install the Lord of Hate to his right rightful rule. Steve knows that they can beat her as the woman dives from the window, rescued by a Krieger who pulls up in a truck. Sam knows that if they follow her, she'll just sidetrack them, wanting to move on the satellite relay. 
Steve calls Bucky, filling them in on the relay they found in the Channel Islands and how he needs him there with him. Bucky tells him about how Hatemonger is targeting Jeremy Merrick and his daughter, but Steve wants them to come along since they'll better protect them in California with them. Bucky knows that something doesn't feel right about this, but Steve doesn't want to argue, hanging up the phone. Bucky tells Jeremy they better pack and leave quickly, knowing after all these years, Steve still sometimes forgets he can't order him around anymore. And he's not mad at Steve, just worried about his friend. Later on, Jeremy's daughter doesn't want to leave, but the man assures her that they will be safe with Bucky and Ariel. Bucky apologizes for the mess as Jeremy notes that he's still upset. Bucky isn't, knowing that it's just the Captain America-centric drama is rather taxing on him. Jeremy wonders if this is why he's not suited up in his Captain America costume, but Bucky tells him that that was a while ago and something isn't sitting right with him about the signal that Steve is after. Jeremy takes a look at the codes, thinking there is something more to them. Steve and John Mimo approach the lighthouse on the Channel Islands as Sam recons the area from above, finding nothing but the lighthouse on the small island. Steve thinks that Bucky had a point and maybe they should slow things down, but they could be right on top of their targets. He decides to give John the green light as the captains infiltrate the island, smashing their way into the lighthouse, which suddenly explodes. Bucky meanwhile finds that they can't get through to Steve or the others, thinking that he should be there. Jeremy knows that he wants to be there since he is Captain America whether he likes it or not. Bucky doesn't think that this is that simple, but Jeremy knows that being a Cap never is. Jeremy understands, having felt it in Afghanistan and Iraq, but for him it wasn't about fighting, it was about protecting the ones who served under him, but not from an enemy, but from his own military. He tells Bucky of one day when they came back from a nasty patrol, there were some men who were salesmen waiting for them at the base, trying to get them all to hand over their danger pay for down payments on new trucks, among other things. He says that the kids would have to sign up for another tour and face death all over again just to pay for a crap they got sold and he saw it as his job to make sure that never happened and they had what they needed when they got home. Things not like trucks or cars but mental health care and real support. Things he knows they needed. As he thinks about it, Jeremy realises something about the signal, knowing the signal on the island was a masking relay. Bucky knows the actual source is somewhere else but close by as Jeremy wants to help, telling his daughter that she'll have to go to see their Uncle Dave in Utah, wanting to take his special plane. Bucky wants to get a hold of Aaron somehow, and Jeremy thinks they can use the plane's radio since they can broadcast their own special message to the network. The captains, meanwhile, are all woken by Krieger, Hatemonger, and Superior, who tell the heroes that they were just saved. Also, they can be forced to watch the country they love be broken. Superior knows that the Stars and Stripes will soon instill fear, panic, and malevolence in the hearts of every American, but she already knows that America has been all of that since its inception. Steve knows that if they actually think that's true, they don't understand America at all. Hatemonger transforms into Knox, telling Steve that it will be harder to argue that when their public executions get huge ratings for their TV channel. Steve knows that this explains why he had a terrorist dress up as him and wreak havoc, and why he tried to turn the other captain communities against them, and it was all to prime the pump with the public, and brainwashing them was just the final step. Krieger wants to show the hero how that works, having Superior grab Steve as Mongo knocks Sam and John out. Krieger begins to brainwash Steve with his own shield, forcing him to see America burning under the rule of Hatemonger. Jeremy meanwhile pilots the jet towards Mount San Antonio, the location of the real signal relay. He tells the captains that they are almost at the drop zone, wanting them to be ready for anything as Ariel thinks that it's good to see Bucky in his Captain America costume again. Bucky and Ariel leap from the plane to go rescue their friends as Sam tries to snap Steve out of his daze. The room explodes as Bucky and Ariel arrive attacking the villains and freeing their friends. Hatemonger demands to know how many Captain Americans are there and John knows the short answer is a truckload as Aaron and the other captains from the network arrive. The heroes get to work as Jeremy works to set up his energy admitter with John, who keeps Hatemonger busy for the hero. Steve thanks Aaron for assembling the group but the man knows that it was hard work covering that many states without a frequent flyer number. But saving America is a heck of a sales pitch. Krieger thinks that the heroes assembling have made it easier for her to kill them all, calling them all poses, but Steve tells her that they are the real thing, knowing that she has something of his. He catches her fist, allowing Joe and Nichelle to take her down. Jeremy activates his admitter, using it to imprison Hatemonger again as Steve retrieves his shield. Sam thinks that he's like a little boy who lost his dog, telling Nichelle that he wasn't sure he'd see her again. The woman knows that punching Nazis is something they all like to do, as Bucky notices the basement's broadcast cameras are now live, thinking Steve should say something to the people. Steve refuses, 
Sanders, knowing that the world has heard enough of his speeches, and it's the network's turn. Aaron takes charge, introducing the Captain's Network, telling the watching people that some might like them and some might not. But that's what makes America America, since you can go 50 feet or 50 miles and suddenly no one looks like you and it all feels different, but that's what makes the country amazing. He assures the people that the network have their back as weeks later, Steve visits the Smithsonian, knowing that the dream is still alive in the exhibit along with Lincoln's hat, Harvey Milk's billhorn, and Rosa Parks' handmade dress. He looks over the shields on display as a small child recognizes him as Captain America. Steve learns the boy's name is Leo, telling him that he might be Captain America, but he thinks the boy might be as well, as is everyone else in the room. 